Okay, good afternoon. Um, yes, I didn't want to talk about skin, but now uh, Phyllis told us about B2B and that before B2B you had industrial market research and just to inform you, the I of skim stands for industrial, so we are very old and cracking, but let's still talk about quantitative research. It's very fascinating. In business, as well as in a uh, non-profit organization, management is constantly confronted with a variety of questions, and to solve these questions, they need information and insights. For instance, when you plan to build a new plant for dusters, you want to know how many of these dust removers will be bought per year, and what share of that pie would be yours or you produce a great prescription medicine which doctors really value and prescribe but instead of going to the doctor the patients tend to buy over the counter which uh, all kinds of products which are less effective but is that what they are familiar with so how many patients could have consulted the doctor for that indication but didn't what would that mean for your business or what's the impact if you increase your price with 10 percent all these questions, all these issues can be solved with quantitative research. And Ray, can you give me control because, yes, there we are. Uh, with quantitative research, you can describe, you can monitor, you can explain, you can predict. So you are and can be relevant and you are and can be wanted. That's the nice thing of quantitative research. With quantitative research, you measure and you express information numerically. But when you have a lot of data, it doesn't always mean you can use it in quantitative research. For instance, you can have tons of data about one individual. Analyzing data is not quantitative research, because you can only say something about that individual. When you have data about many, or at least a group of entities, whether it's men, women, companies, and you analyze these data, that is quantitative research. So key is that you have data about a group of entities. And analyze, analyzing generates relevant information about the group of entities. For instance, 6% is willing to invest or buy. Nowadays, Individuals and companies are overloaded with data and there are numerous data sources and types of data we can use in quantitative research. These sources can be internal, like the number and type of products sold or returned, or sources are external, like data you get when you scrape the internet. Most of these data are collected automatically as part of a process like scanning your shoppings at a grocery store so you know what you have to pay. But as a side product, at the end of the day, we know precisely what has been sold that day. Because we record a lot of data automatically and consciously or unconsciously, everybody is entering data. A lot of facts in databases, companies are overloaded with data. This pile of data can be mined in the hope to find diamonds of insights. That pile of data a company has access to is called often big data. Big data can also be collected deliberately, but not big data, but, but data can also be collected deliberately in order to answer a business question. For instance, you can ask people to complete a diary about the food intake, or you can interview people about habits, etc. So, depending on what the data you have, what you want to know, and how much you want to spend on data, you define which source of data to use. As I said, a lot of data is recorded automatically. And that pile will only increase. That's what is what and why everybody has his opinion about big data. Automatically recorded data is often not generated with the intention to answer a specific business question. So analyzing big data to answer business questions has its specific challenges and requirements. When we deliberately collect data, 
it is often done on purpose to answer a business question. So when defining and designing a survey, you already have in mind what issue you want to solve and you take care that the data collected is qualified to serve that purpose. And there are many ways to collect data. Nowadays, the most common way is to collect data via online interviews, at least in the Western or Northern world. So people answer questions and complete interviews on their computer, on their tablet, on their smartphone. But you can also ask questions by phone. Or you can do it face to face. Or send them a questionnaire by mail. Each method has its pros and its cons. You conduct a study in order to draw conclusions or say something about the group of people that are of relevance. For instance, in political polls you want to say something about the people who may vote. And when you are Heineken or Budweiser or Kalsberg, you want to draw conclusions about beer drinkers. The total group you want to say something about is called the population, or as Phillips called it, the universe. In quantitative research, it's critical to be precise and clearly define that population. For instance, in the beer drinkers example, you may define the population of beer drinkers as all men and women in Estonia of 18 years and older who drink beer. But you could also define that population as all men and women in Estonia 18 years and older who drink at least two glasses or more of beer and are involved in the choice which beer to buy. The second definition is reducing the population but it's more precise and consequently it's likely that people belonging to the inner circle know better, particularly when it regards their behavior or experience. So the answers will be more reliable and less biased. When defining the population, it's critical to bear in mind what is the business questions we have to answer. For instance, if you want to introduce a new type of beer, or a beer alike drink, you want to know the reaction of everyone who drinks once in a while beer. But so in that case you took the take the first definition of the population. But if you want to introduce larger cans, the reaction of the heavy users seems to be more relevant. So you define the population differently. If you interview everybody in the population, you call that a census, but interviewing everybody is a challenge, expensive, and not needed. But interviewing everybody is very expensive, as I said. What you normally do is researching a subset of the population, a sample. You can compare it with tasting wine. You take a sip of wine, roll it in your mouth, and taste it. It gives you a good impression of the wine in the bottle. So, in quantitative research, we describe and draw conclusions about populations by taking a sip or a sample and analyze that sample. There are different ways of sampling or different types of samples. It is critical that the way of sampling is not impacting the results of the study. In a random probability sample, Everybody in the population we are researching has the same chance to be included in the study. It is a random draw, just like a lottery. The people who love the brand have an equal chance to be selected as the people who hate the brand. In reality, a population, however, is often skewed. You have many people who consume a little and a few people who consume a lot. But these people who consume a lot are very relevant to solve the business issue. In a randomly probability sample, the likelihood to find someone who consumes a lot is very low. And you run the risk that you only interview consumers who consume a little. In that case, you split the sample and define quota. Or you set a number of interviews for a certain group. So for instance, I want to interview max 500 low consumers and you set a certain number for the high-end users, so you want to have 50 high consumers. 
So we oversample high consumers. In no time, randomly, you have selected your low consumers. So you close the sampling, but randomly you continue finding consumers who take a, use a lot, and that takes longer. When it's very, very hard or impossible to find rare consumers, like the high consumer, you switch to convenience sampling or snowballing. You instruct recruiters to look for and find these specific people and when you find one, you interview her and ask her, do you know someone else who fit the same criteria? Because high users tend to know high users. Formally, it's not random. But as long as there is no relation with the issue to solve, hence you do not try to influence the results, it can be acceptable. And it can be a solution. Nowadays, panel agencies have panels or large databases with people they know a lot about and who indicate they are willing to participate in research. Because they know a lot about these people, they can select the people in the database that may fit your population definition. From this group, they randomly draw a sample. Your sample should be represent representative. It should represent the research population. Yeah? That means the distribution of the entities in your sample should mimic the distribution of the entities in the population. So the proportion of women, old people, obese people, smart people, people from ur urban areas in the sample so should be identical to the distribution in the population. So you can say something about that population. So you can draw conclusions and also you can answer questions with regard to impact of your decisions. Like with quota sampling, some groups in the sample can be disproportionately big or overrepresented. If in that case you want to say something about the total sample, you have to downweight them. Yeah, so you weight the the the, the high users in order to represent their share in reality. Because we draw a sample and do not include the total population, there is a chance that what we find is not completely representative. So a chance that what we find deviates slightly from reality. Now if we repeat the same study many times, so every time we take a sample and taste it, we will see that the results have a certain margin of error, which is due to pure chance. So when we interpret the outcomes of a study of two groups in the study of two samples, and we see a difference, we have to know if the difference between these two results is pure a consequence of chance, so not relevant, or it reflects a difference which tell us, tells us something about the difference between group A and group B. With significance testing, which is pu a pure statistical exercise, we assess if the difference between the result of two groups or two samples is due to pure chance or if it's real and it has meaning. If it's real, we say the difference is statistically significant. Normally, companies know a lot of the market. For instance, they know what the market share is for their products. And when the market share as assessed in a study deviate from the market share the client knows, you normally calibrate the results or you fine tune the results in such a way that they reflect the real shares. Calibration is often needed because the population we define for our studies is so specific and like people who drink beer is skewed, so by a random sample you don't always get precise the same shares. With weighting and calibration, you can see that in a quantitative research we fine-tune the data and the results in order to reflect the real world. Because you want to provide insight into the real world, or if you want to know what the impact of your action in the real world is, you also want to have figures reflecting that reality. 
That's why results should always mimic reality, results you present. And that is what is meant with the term validity. The results of a quantitative study are valid when the study design and the execution are well founded and the results correspond accurately to the population in the real world. And that is key and often more important than just statistical significance. Quantitative researchers and users of quantitative research often assume everything is logic and assume people react rational. When we look at consumers, and consumers they may be in front of a shelf or they may be looking at an advertisement, then they process information. In quantitative research, we often assume consumers choose and process information rational, and their behavior is a consequence of a rational choice process. But the information and the stimuli perceived by the consumers also do trigger emotional processes in their mind. And emotions ultimately also lead to behavior. This emotional or non-rational choice process is harder to capture in quantitative research. But it's essential you realize it is there. So when you do not include it in your study and in your research design, at least you know what you're missing and you can exp find explanations for difference between your results. When you're missing important parts of reality, the validity of the study is impacted. Now this area of quantitative research where we look at the non-rational part of information processing is developing very fast and that makes it so interesting to be a researcher. You always learn while you answer relative, relevant business issue. Thank you all for attending this training and please do not hesitate to ask questions. So Ray, please can you take over again?